Thank you, Governor and media mogul Mike Huckabee. All right, folks, our final speaker for tonight, and then we're going to have a, uh, a panel discussion and then the, our movie screening. Uh, he was elected to three terms in the U.S. House of Representatives for the state of South Carolina. He was then elected and then re-elected to the Senate, where he became one of the most principled conservative leaders in Washington, D.C. In April of this year, he was named president of the Heritage Foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome back a true champion for all values voters, Senator Jim DeMint. You know, I asked Governor Huckabee to tone it down a little bit after the speaker before him. He didn't help me a bit. I told him that on his way out. Uh, you've got two preachers and now a senator to talk to you tonight, but I uh, appreciate you staying to listen, and it's been um, uh, great to watch some of this from a distance. I was traveling all day, but I got to see the uh, news coverage in the airports, and I know you've been treated to um, a lot of inspirational ideas. Uh, I appreciate you being here tonight. I I've spoken, I guess I've been in 50 or 60 cities uh, in the last uh, few months since I came to Heritage, and I've spoken to thousands of people. But I, spill, I feel especially close to this group here tonight. And that's thanks to, as Governor Huckabee mentioned, the NSA has allowed me to look at a lot of your emails over the last few weeks <laughs> and listen in on a lot of your phone calls. It's almost like I've been living with you the last few weeks. And there's some real interesting and worrisome stories here in the room tonight, and I would like to read a few of those. No, no, I'm, I'm just teasing. I'm not going to do that. But He also mentioned the IRS, but those um, the NSA were, were not nearly as interesting as your tax records. The, the good news is that some of you actually qualify for the Obamacare subsidies. And the rest of you, um, since they're not going to be checking your income anyway, uh, can fudge it a little bit and we can all go on that 600 and some odd million dollar website and sign up tonight. I've heard it was very easy. So you're welcome to jump on the site and sign up for Obamacare tonight. But let's get serious for a minute. I, I want to be as vulnerable as I can with you tonight. I'm Jim, and I'm a recovering politician. <laughs> I've been clean now for 283 days. And I don't mean clean in the sense of a clean CR, which we all know is dirty. But I'm clean like a mud wrestler who just took his first bath in 14 years. <laughs> it took me a long time to accept the fact that I had a really serious problem. But after the Senate passed the 2,700 page health care law and Nancy Pelosi said we had to pass it in order to find out what was in it, I knew that I had hit bottom. I finally entered the Private Citizen Rehabilitation Center at the Heritage Foundation. <clears throat> now, I've been going through the 12-step program of how to turn away from being a senator, and it's actually been a lot easier than I thought. First step, I didn't have to go to the inauguration. <laughs> Second step, I didn't have to go to the State of the Union. <clears throat> Third step, I didn't have to follow Harry Reid's schedule anymore. So I was free. It's been great. Now, I've been learning to accept those things that I can't change, at least for the next three years, and to change what I can, like traveling around the country, talking to all Americans about, appealing to all Americans about how they need to help us stop this dreadful plague we call Obamacare. And they're responding all over the country and getting more and more involved. We just hope it's in time, but we'll never give up the fight at the Heritage Foundation. We're here today to talk about values, and I know all of you have inspired all day by a number of speakers about those things we believe in and, and know are essential to our country. 
I want to try to dig down a little deeper after watching how Washington and America works to see how we can actually use public policy to make sure those values are in America throughout our history and throughout our future. I often define freedom as an environment where millions of people are able to make their own decisions about what they value and what they want to do. That's freedom itself, when you can decide what you value. For freedom to exist, we have to respect the fact that many people have many different values. People with very different beliefs and values can live together in harmony if individuals are allowed to live according to what they believe, to associate freely with those who share their values, and if no central power tries to force them to live by values that they don't believe in. If we try to use the power of government to force our values on others, we are violating their inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's also true that when others use the power of government to violate our values and our freedom to practice our values in all areas of our lives, then it is our right, indeed it is our responsibility, to use the power of our voices and our votes to replace that government. All of us believe that shared values are essential to a prosperous and civil society. We call these traditional or family values. Sometimes we call them Judeo-Christian values because so many of the value, values and principles that built this great land were derived from the Bible. So as we approach all the negative and divisive debates about public policy here in Washington, it's important for us to remember the greatest biblical value of all, which is love. Now don't worry, I'm not going to pull a Bill Clinton on you. I'm not going to bite my lip and tear up and tell you that I feel your pain, even though I probably do. But if we want to overcome the negative and divisive aspects of politics and unite our country around a common set of values and virtues, we all need to fall in love with America again. Love unites people from all walks of life. I'm not talking about mushy, bleeding heart, liberal gibberish. I'm talking about love in the sense that Edmund Burke understood it. I'm talking about love that begins with the little platoons in our lives, the love of family, church, and community that Burke called the first link in a series of relationships that create our love of country and of mankind. This is the indispensable love of a free and self-governing people. It is the love that raises children to be good, responsible citizens, the love that cares for the needy and reaches out to those who are down and out. It is a love that binds individuals to communities and ultimately communities into a unified nation. Burke understood, as did all our founding fathers, something too few people here in Washington understand today. Strong nations are built from the ground up, not from the top down. America, from its beginning, has been unique in all the world, exceptional, as I like to say, because we were individualistic, decentralized, we were a ground-up nation. There was very little centralized control in early America. People made their own decisions about what they wanted to do and about what they valued. America was organized into millions of tight-knit little platoons that loved each other, cared for each other. Americans have always been very diverse, but their attachment to their families, churches, volunteer organizations, and communities created a spirit of unity and love throughout our nation. Today, there are too many politicians in Washington who think the federal government should make more decisions for everyone. They think that if everyone is forced to do the same thing and believe the same things, that there will be more equality and unity. But when people have many different values and beliefs, if they are forced 
to endorse, pay for, or participate in activities that violate their conscience. This creates disharmony and division, even hate. Politics should not be about who gets to force their opinions down the throats of others. It should be about protecting the freedom of everyone to live out what they value. That means Washington can't decide for everyone. If Americans with many different values and beliefs are given the freedom to make their own choices and decisions, if they're given the freedom of association and expression, then in spite of the incredible diversity across our land, more Americans will fall in love with their fellow citizens and fall in love with America again. We can unite America and restore our prosperity and our strength, but it can't be done from Washington. We must push dollars and decisions back to the states and to the people. States must be allowed to compete for the best business environment, the best schools, the best health plans. And states must be allowed to compete for the best environment to live and raise a family. States should be more or have more flexibility to develop their own energy resources and keep their own gas tax dollars to build their roads and bridges when and where they want to build them. This is the constitutional freedom, or excuse me, constitutional principle of federalism. It is clearly defined by the 10th Amendment, and it also applies to many of the social issues that we care most deeply about. Marriage is an institution of civil society, and no one in government has a right to redefine it. Marriage is the most foundational cultural and economic institution in our society. <laughs> Marriage between a man and a woman is by far the best environment to raise children and create responsible citizens. States have regulated marriage to protect it, but there is nothing in our federal constitution that gives Congress, the President, or the Supreme Court the right to redefine or regulate marriage. <laughs> marriage is an issue that should be left to the states, the people, and the church. The states and the people are also leading the battle to protect unborn children. President Obama and the Democratic Party still deny that unborn children are even human beings, and they don't believe that unborn girls and boys have any rights at all, not even the right to life. None of us can rest as long as over 3,000 unborn children lose their lives every day in America. But conservative candidates for Congress and the presidency and value voters should not be debating with ourselves about abortions and exceptions for abortions when the other side hasn't even agreed that we're talking about a human being. We should be proclaiming the humanity of unborn children and demanding that they are given basic human rights. We should be challenging liberals to look at the sonograms and listen to the heartbeats and make them defend their irrational and inhumane position. And we should give them the names of the children who are alive today because they're selfless mothers who saw one of these sonograms and made an informed and compassionate choice. Early next year, the Heritage Foundation will present a policy platform and a communication plan that we believe will unite America around the principles and values that made this country the greatest, most prosperous, and most compassionate nation in history. It will help Americans see how conservative principles and traditional values will create a stronger economy, a stronger culture, and a stronger nation. It will convince Americans that conservative ideas will create more opportunities and a brighter future for them and their families. And it will show Americans how moving dollars and decisions out of Washington and back to individuals, families, and communities will solve many of the divisive problems created by one-size-fits-all Washington solutions. Fringe, I should say friends, as we cringe 
at what's going on in Washington today, particularly with Obamacare. It should remind us that every time Washington tries to control another part of our lives, it creates division and diminishes the love that Americans have for our country. That's why we at Heritage continue to fight the implementation of this terrible law, and we will continue to do it this week, next week, next year, until we defeat it. But despite the bitterness and division caused by our overbearing federal government, let's remember that our government is not who we are. It's not America. We the people are America. We are God's stewards of this great land. God has blessed us, forgiven us, and loved us beyond anything we deserve. Let us count our blessings, love each other, including our political enemies, and every day, let's always fall in love with our wonderful America over and over again. Amen, and thank you.